Hi, welcome to yet another session of uh, ENT Talks. Myself, Dr. Vivek Shashindran, and today we would be touching upon complications in silentoscopy. Well, in my previous videos, I did discuss about silentoscopy as a procedure, the indications for silentoscopy, and uh, we did have some queries regarding what are the complications uh, that can be associated with silentoscopy. Yes, so like any surgical procedure, silentoscopy has its own share of complications. If you could kind of recollect what is being done in this procedure, we kind of identify the natural opening of the salivary gland. In the sense, if you have the submandibular gland pathology, you could go identify the opening of the submandibular gland in the floor of the mouth. Or if it's a parotid gland pathology, we identify the opening of the duct in the buccal mucus or right inside the cheek. Now we dilate that natural opening and through that opening we introduce the endoscope, the miniature, the silent endoscope. Now this is actually a minimally invasive procedure, but sometimes we can have challenges in identifying the ductal opening. So it could be scarred, it could be stenosed or like totally sealed off or if the patient has undergone some kind of previous surgical procedure in that area, you may have difficulty in identify the, identifying the ductal opening. So there could be a situation where you are stuck where and you are not able to identify the natural opening so what next so in those situations we kind of make a small incision around this the area of the natural opening and then dissect out the duct and subsequently make a fresh incision over the duct and then subsequently introduce the endoscope through that incision that we have made over the duct so difficulty in identifying the natural opening of the gland is one issue that we could come across the Second thing is, you could accidentally overshoot the duct. So once you identify the duct, it's important that the camera goes right inside the ductal opening through the duct so that you can see the ductal system clearly. Now sometimes what happens if the duct is kind of acutely inflamed or if there has been scarring, you tend to apply force and the scope kind of pierces through the walls of the duct and you end up in a false passage. Now it's very important that you kind of identify or realize that you have, you are not within the duct, you have kind of gone outside the duct or you are in a false passage because when you do sial endoscopy, what happens is that there's a lot of irrigation that is being used. So if you enter a false passage and continue irrigating, all this fluid will kind of accumulate within the next spaces. So which could be a problem if not detected or identified at the right time. Apart from this, we have other issues where this duct is not a straight channel so it has its course like you know there are certain muscles around which the duct kind of bends and this bend can be very acutely angulated so in some cases what you got to realize is that the endoscope that you are using is basically a semi-flexible i would say more of a rigid endoscope but semi-flexible it's not a fully flexible endoscope so it's not possible for this endoscope to kind of you know go through a very acute bend so these are the limitations that we have with the silent endoscope so there are situations where you can actually see the calculus but it is right inside a bend so you cannot instrument you cannot kind of manipulate now those are the situations where you kind of think of other options like your combined approach. So I think in my previous video, I did talk about how you can use silentoscopy and combine it with the intraoral incision. For example, for the submandibular gland or for the parotid for that meat matter, you could probably place a cosmetically acceptable incision and subsequently trace the stone with the endoscope and then mark the stone, locate where the stone is and then trace it from an external approach. So still preserving the gland. So this decision making. Now apart from that, there are situations where you fail, now where you can't identify the duct, uh, where you can't introduce the scope. Now these are very, very rare instances. So, and when we do combined approaches, again, it is very important to keep an idea about the various nerves that come in relation to these ducts. For example, in the submandibular duct, we have the lingual nerve which crosses the submandibular ducts. So when you do a combined approach, it's important that you kind of dissect out and identify the lingual nerve or the patient can have problems like lingual paresthesia which is a problem if the lingual nerve is injured. Similarly, when you do a combined approach with the parotid gland, obviously we are concerned about the facial nerve. 
So it does have its share of complications, but then the incidence of complications with silent endoscopy is relatively very low.